I V M. Did you miss saving taxes for the last year? That's FY 2019-20 by any chance? So here it is, guys. Deadline for tax savings for financial year 2019-20 has now been extended to 31st July 2020. Paytm Money now helps you to save taxes up to rupees 62,400 with its Jodi Number One of Tax Saver Mutual Funds and NPS on its platform. Invest in Tax Saver ELSS funds to claim a tax deduction of rupees 1.5 lakh and save up to rupees 46,800 on taxes under Section 80C. Along with that. Now you can also invest in the national pension system, the NPS, for an additional tax deduction of up to rupees fifty thousand, and enjoy tax savings up to rupees fifteen thousand six hundred. All of it on Paytm Money. So, download the Paytm Money app, get your KYC done instantly, and become investment ready within minutes. Now, or tax बचाने के लिए भी Paytm करो. Folks, welcome to Better Better. I'm your host Anupam Gupta, P50 on Twitter, and this is the Global Investing. Special, my guest, investor. I have with me Swastik Nigam, founder and CEO, and Pratik Jain, co-founder and head Americas at Investor. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff, guys. We're going to talk about global investing. I've had a couple of shows on similar lines, but we need to drill down this topic a little bit more. I'm really thrilled to have these guys with us, investor. They're a very interesting platform. They're offering a truly unique product. So let's get started. Swastik, Pratik, thank you, guys. Welcome to Pesa Pesa. Thanks for doing this show for our listeners, and let's start with your background. Uh, how you guys met? Uh, what were you doing? And how did the idea of Investor come along? Let's start from there. Sure. Thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Anupam, and thanks for having us. Um, so I'm Swastik um, for your listeners, and I graduated from I'm Ahmedabad back in 2008, and I joined investment banking, which was you know really wide for career then, especially. Uh, You know, I spent my time in London for over a decade, and where I was trading multi-asset uh, products. When I left investment banking, I, you know, recognized that India had had such limited access to investing overseas, whereas I had been in a slightly more privileged place, having this unmitigated access to investing globally. And that's where the idea of investors sort of cropped up as to how can we help bridge that gap of allowing India and Indians to be able to invest globally. Um, Pratik and I are fellow batchmates from Ahmedabad, and I'd just like you know Pratik to give a quick short introduction of himself. Hey, hi Anupam, I was so glad to be on the show. Uh, a quick background on my end: I'm based in New York. I've been trading commodities at Deutsche Bank for about 11 years uh, before Investor. I was, uh, as Swastik mentioned, uh, with him at IMM Dubai, and before that, I've done undergrad at IIT Kanpur. Uh, so, last ten years have been have been quite exciting. Uh, in fact, my first day on the trading floor was the day of Lehman collapse. So, we've seen a fair amount of ups and downs in the financial career. Uh, Swastik and I had uh, had been close since last fifteen years, and often conspired on how we can build something together, uh, but geographically being. Very separated, had derailed such plans very quickly. So when Swastik thought of Investor and proposed this idea, it came as a perfect opportunity to dive in and for us to you know, start working together on something. Great. So now let's get into this concept of global investing, guys. Um, I have done a couple of shows in the past from both the sides um, of the table. Uh, people who are offering a brokerage account and people who are offering an international product uh, on the mutual fund side, like the S and P five hundred index fund. So. In the current macroeconomic scenario that we have, um, last couple of months have been quite rough, and who knows now what's going to happen in the future, given the way this entire virus thing has played out. I want you guys to build a use case for me for global investing with this macroeconomic uh, framework, because I guess there is a case for asset allocation. I mean, the way the S and P 500 and Nasdaq have gone up uh, since the bottom has been mind-boggling. Um, so let's let's get your views from that perspective on this. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think you know, and this this actually does go back to the time even when I was you know toying with the idea originally. The if you look at what's happened in India, right? Of course, we've had increasing wealth, which needs this diversification, and that's a personal finance story as well. But then beyond that, look at what we live, eat, consume now. You know, these are some of the largest tech companies that we are large consumers of. For example, if you think of the two largest e-commerce players in India, you can't buy a share of them on the domestic 
courses, uh, you need accessing, you know, you want to try to wall- access Walmart or Amazon stuff. So th- that's part of, you know, this, this theme where we've become such large consumers of companies that are not domestically listed. And we can't necessarily say these are just U.S. stocks. These are companies which actually are supranationals, um, where a large portion of the revenue, in fact, comes from outside of the U.S., in effect. It's just incidental that they're listed in the U.S., in effect, right? So for example, Apple, for Apple, 60% of its revenue is originated overseas. Um, and, you know, focusing in on India, particularly, we're such a, a massive, uh, you know, population. And for us, of course, we need... We need to be able to create those jobs. And for what we do to create those jobs is we've been systematically been liberalizing a lot of our uh, of our FDI policy, for example, right? Um, and that meant that you can now have overseas ownership uh, and allow 100% ownership domestically of, of those franchises. Um, and that just means that now there will be very limited, you know, there'll be a reducing ability for people in India as well to be able to invest domestically because these companies will not need to do this domestically. And COVID-19 actually has shown that because S&P 500, NASDAQ, right? These are large listings of companies which have been extremely resilient, particularly in technology. And technology does not really care a lot about tariffs and borders very frequently, right? Um, Things which traditional industries do. And that's why we've seen that, particularly in those sectors, um, both one due to the consumer side of it, where consumers have now lapped up technology far easier. And secondly, where particularly for a country like India, where you can have 100% FDI if you're in technology, um, you know, those sectors have done extremely well. Um, and that's the nuance. That's the nuance where we see that the macroeconomic picture in a place like India, where increasing ownership uh, we will notice may not necessarily be completely domestic. You know, you, you, I mentioned a tweet recently about Atmanirbhar, where we no, sort of yeah. say that, uh, you know, make uh, Atmanirbhar, make in India doesn't mean owned by Indians, right? And what we're trying to say is actually, we're just allowing you back a portion of that story where you can own in India as well. Uh, you know, you, you can be an Indian and own those assets, even though they just incidentally listed overseas. Yeah, it's interesting. I've had this conversation on Twitter with a few people who, in fact, now this is the first time that I've heard someone say that they're, it's obviously just one conversation. It doesn't. It's not representative of the entire picture. But it was still interesting to hear from this one person that I was having this conversation with that he doesn't, you know, he only invests in in US stocks. And I was like, wow, okay, that is seriously interesting. And especially if you have a fairly strong index like the Nasdaq 100 or the or the S&P 500, both of which are totally accessible now to India. And that's what I want to talk about now. Um, this was missing 10 years ago. If you wanted to buy U.S. stocks, there was a ton of regulation that just stopped you. And the regulation has opened up in specific what's called the RBI LRM scheme. That's the uh, Reserve Bank of India allowing each Indian to invest, I think, quarter of a million dollars at 250,000 USD, which is a fairly large amount abroad. So that's the enabling thing. But it's not as easy as that because opening an account with a U.S. broker, having a DMAT, linking it to your bank... That's still a pain. Or I don't know where it is now because I remember I tried doing this somewhere last year and it just it just didn't work for me. So can you guys give us give our listeners a perspective on this? Let's, you know, let's build a use case of someone who actually wants to buy fang stocks out there, or you know, even an index. And he wants to do that directly sitting out here in India. He knows it's possible. Walk our listeners through what is what are the enabling factors and how things have changed and how this could actually be a very viable option today. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good point. See, so the LRS, of course, I think it was initiated back in 2004, and it started off at a much smaller $25,000 number per head per year, right? And that has, of course, galloped now, and uh, it's sitting at a very generous and comfortable $250,000. I mean, if you were to sort of just momentarily look at it and compare it to a uh, resident in China, he can only he or she can only invest about fifty thousand dollars per head per year. So you have to recognize the the liberalization that India has undergone. Um, the process in itself is, you know, I recognize those challenges. And those challenges come about also because historically, you know, if you were a brokerage in the US, right, you were charging about five to ten dollars per transaction 
and you look at a uh, at a at a low wealth country, you, it, it doesn't look like a very attractive proposition for you know trying to get clients from an emerging market necessarily, right? Now, of course, we have seen wealth in India increase, and that's that. That actually answers the, the challenges you faced. That they were not necessarily trying to look and trying to provide for Indian clients necessarily. I think some of the larger private banks would tend to provide it for clients who are ultra high net worth individuals and had built a franchise um, over the last decade or so in that matter. But, but you know, the regular Indian resident, Indian investor has had very limited opportunity to invest, uh, as you rightly pointed out. But what's definitely changed is one, LRS, and secondly, I think post the global financial crisis, the penetration of many of these U.S. companies into Indian lives has sort of, you know, turned on a light bulb, uh, which means that people actually do want to be more interested. Secondly, about the opening of the brokerage accounts, right? I think digital KYC is a very, very young feature. You know, you needed to have historically go through reefs of documentation, and many of the traditional players still need you to go through a lot of uh, documentation. And um, recognize that, of course, in LRS, it's an RBI directive which allows Indians to invest overseas. However, the service providers are are overseas. But you're, and by, you're a US-based broker or UK-based broker. And uh, what does end up happening is uh, we're performing KYC according to those jurisdictions where digital KYC is now a little bit more mature. Um, and that's really allowed us to for example, be able to create accounts very, very quickly, ensuring that, you know, the KYC procedures as based in those jurisdictions is followed. Uh, and that's been why, you know, we've suddenly seen this sort of interest on one side from the demand side come through because we become these large consumers and, uh, and these companies have done extremely well as well. And then liberalization and actually opening of those accounts uh, to that matter. What stays still, you know, a very young story is how much are Indians investing overseas? And that's still, you know, that's still work in progress where regulators, banks, et cetera, who control the remittance procedures are, you know, working towards making it slightly easier in effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so b before I wrap up this first part of our recording, uh, Swastik, I need to understand one thing. The... So what's the difference between me sitting out here in my existing mutual fund account, just going for an international fund? And now I have options, right? I've got uh, ETFs, I've got fund of funds, I've got trade of funds um, versus opening an account with a US broker via, say, someone like you and going through a process. So what's so how would you compare these two options to me on global investing? Yeah. Um... So if you look at the the former, right, a domestic rupee denominated fund, a feeder fund or so on, one is who is managing it. So you're actually, you've, you know, uh, you've got a third party manager managing it. And of course, you've got whether it's an ETF, which is just following an index and you can plug some money in and let it grow at that index level and denominated in rupees. Or the alternate is that uh, you have some active manager which is managing it on your behalf, right? Uh, for who, which you pay a fee. Um, for the, however, if, you know, you were to come to a US brokerage and be able to invest directly. What you do receive is a much larger universe because otherwise you'd need each and every one of those funds to create a domestic rupee denominated fund, you know, before you can actually access it, which is why the universe of funds in India are very, very few at the moment. And where they are, the cost structures are higher as well. Um, for example, you know, if you wanted to just invest in U.S. Treasury uh, as a ETF, right? One is that the ETF cost overseas is going to be significantly lower than the the rupee wrapped fund domestically. Mm. Secondly, tomorrow, you know, okay, today I've got money in U.S. Treasuries. Tomorrow I want a U.S. Uh, corporate bond a tracker, for example, right? And you couldn't do that in India. You can only have these very, very few limited funds. Uh, and thirdly, you actually can't do asset selection yourself, right? So if you're saying, okay, investing in NASDAQ 100 or S&P 500, uh, but you might say, actually, I only want to invest in top five or 10 companies, and you can't do that sitting here, right? Um, so that's, that's the 
significant departure between a domestically listed fund of any kind or a domestically accessible fund vis-a-vis opening a brokerage account overseas, being able to invest in not just uh, those same funds actually at much lower costs, but even being able to pick and choose different asset types and asset classes, as mm-hmm. well as a plethora of many more funds. Sure. Got it. Really interesting. So, folks, that's a wrap on the first part of this episode. We've introduced the concept of global investing. We've introduced, you know, we've spoken about how it's possible for us here now, um, whether via the regulations or via through or via the brokerage account. So both of them are there in place. On the other side of this break, we're going to come back. We're going to talk about the actual service that the investor offers. And it's a huge, um, it's a very interesting product that they've got. We're, we're going to talk about specifically that. And don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. I want to thank Intel for supporting our show. We're all loving working from home. But let's be honest, there are complications to this. For example, getting help from IT folks if your PC is down can be a challenge because you can't just walk up to the IT support desk anymore to get your issues sorted out. Well, you'll be happy to hear that I have a solution for all your work from home pains. The Intel vPro platform. The platform comes packed with Intel Active Management technology that lets your IT teams remotely manage your system, fix the problems even when the PCs aren't near them, or are unresponsive, especially with the reduced desk site visits. So it means more time getting your work done and less time spent on getting support. What's more, the vPro platform also maximizes all your PC security, stability, and performance needs. Visit intel.in slash more with vPro, that's vPRO, to discover how you can do more of what you want and less of what you don't. If you're listening on the IVM Podcast Android app, you will be able to click the link that's visible to you now. Folks, welcome back to the second part of our Global Investing Special with Vinvesta. My guests today are Swasit Nigam, founder and CEO at Vinvesta, and Pratik Jain, co-founder and head America's ad invest on the first part of this episode, we were talking about the concept of global investing and enabling stuff like uh, the RBI liberal remittance scheme and other things. On this side of the break, in this part of the episode, we are going to talk about the product, Investor, and what it offers and how it's different. So, Swasik and Pratik, welcome back. Let's talk about your product in specific, right? Because back in April, um, I've had vested also on on the show and uh, we've spoken about the concept of global investing or international investing as it was with them. So what do you guys offer and how is it different from what, uh, from what else is there? Sure. Thanks, uh, Anupam. I think one of the, you know, distinctions is that, uh, well, I, I can speak of it from my, from my experience, right. And having spent over a decade in financial services, it's quite important to be able to get the form right something that we and I am comfortable with. If I were to say that I want my mother to be a client of investors, I want her to be protected, insured in in as many ways as possible. And that just is not just necessarily in the monetary part, but as well as to how you design uh, around regulated uh, financial services. Um, And so when we started on thinking about this, we recognized that there is no regime domestically in India on overseas brokerage as a self-directed broker, right? Um, every broker domestically in India is linked to a, a domestic venue in effect. And uh, that got about us to think that technically, because it's an unregulated space, there is a wide variety of ways to be able to form this. But we were quite clear that we wanted to provide it in a way that is extremely transparent, is regulatory appro- regulatorily appropriate. And uh, like I mentioned, something that, you know, I could be very clear in providing to people that I know. Uh, so when we speak of the transparency, so for example, our terms and conditions, we said needs to be something so simple that a 10-year-old could read them. You know, we spoke, we speak of it as well on our, on our website. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the regulatory framework that we utilize is of the, of the UK's FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority. Now, one of the unique parts is that as a UK-based establishment, we can service clients, you know, very clearly and legitimately, not just in the UK, the EEA, but even outside the UK and the European Economic Area and provide services to clients and uh, and do it as a broker, right? Uh, so that's how, you know, we designed it to be very clean and very clear. The added protection it automatically brings up is that, you know, we've got our partner brokers based in the U.S., uh, and we're based in the UK and you get, you know, the protections both from the US based SIPC protection of $500,000 as well as that 85,000 pound, you know, UK based FSCS protections. Um, 
and and that's that's how you know we looked at actually building the regulatory framework in our in our in our legal framework slightly differently in offering this product. The second thing is we don't look at necessarily just uh, U.S. brokerage, right? We did mention that many of these securities are just listed in the U.S. Incidentally, mm. but uh, we think that we're we're building this for a global Indian. Not every resident wants to necessarily just invest in securities; they might want to access other asset classes. And that's the larger vision for Vinvesta. We don't want it to be limited to securities listed in a unique location. But if you want to think of buying anything anywhere in the world and own that as an asset, which is you know allowed under the uh, RBI's guidelines of the LRS, uh, you should be able to do that. And that's how we're looking at building Vinvesta. Yeah, that's what I found really interesting because I had a look at the website, and one particular thing that stood out to me was the multi-currency account. Just what exactly is that? Sounds really interesting. Um, yeah, actually, that's you know that's part of it, right? The if you look at what the LRS allows people in India to do, it's to invest in different kinds of assets, equity, debt securities, you know, real estate is, for example, another one of those assets, right? We we'll speak of it a bit later as well. Uh, but the multi-currency account is to enable you to invest uh, such that you can use that for any other investment purpose that's uh, legitimately allowed for you to invest overseas. Um, and this, again, points towards the, you know, we've seen a, this entire neo-banking, um, you know, progress in the UK, particularly with many large neo-banks and utilize a framework similar to theirs in terms of how we are bringing uh, these multi-currency accounts for Indians to be able to invest uh, overseas. The you know we've lived in in India and we've we've sort of always thought of ourselves as being limited by rupee denominated assets. But of course, you know, as Indians have started traveling more, going overseas, whether the aspir- the aspirations, of course, have been increasing, and and that's what we are also looking to to help provide for. Right? Um, they also will assist with any kinds of forward goal-oriented investing opportunities or investment requirements for clients. Uh, Pratik, did you want to add on this, on the multi-currency accounts? Uh, sure. I mean, in terms of specific examples that you're saying you might be saving for your you know, child's education uh, in 10 years, if you might want to send your child to UK and you know, want to make investments in UK, right now there is and save in GPP, there is no current mechanism for you to do so. Uh, you can do a goal-oriented based deposits in the multi-currency account where you, let's say you send 10,000 pounds a year and uh, build up that kitty over time. Uh, could even have additional liabilities, like I want to have a big travel plan next year in Europe and I want, you know, I'm worried about the depreciation a little bit and I want to the money to sit in, uh, in euros. And you can, basically it allows you to plan a lot uh, for the future uh, specifically, right? so work with yeah. me on that. That sounds really interesting. Let's actually talk about the use case of someone who wants to uh, fund his daughter's education in the US or in the UK. <laughs> so pretty expensive, yeah. and wants to prepare, you know, prepare for it ten, twelve years out. So he has that much time to build out his thing. How would you guys set up a product for him that will meet these goals? Sure, absolutely. So. Uh, 10, 10 years is a, is a good time to plan that uh, because, uh, you know, if, as you say, international education is getting very expensive. Uh, uh, the product could be two ways. You can, you can invest in low yield, but safe investments like the U.S. US Treasury bonds or investment grade bonds. And that's the benefit of having both a dollar account, uh, the bank account, as well as a brokerage account linked in the same platform. You can move the investments between the two as and when you feel the need of, you know, when, when you have, have the need of the cash, you are able to freely move the money from your uh, securities investment back into the account. I can even allocate how much portion of your portfolio you want as cash versus being in, uh, being in investments. Uh, secondly, um, Having this, uh, you know, before sending the kid uh, to the school itself, this allows you to open a bank account on their behalf or on their name, even before they start to travel. Right now, students, when they travel to U.S., for example, they need to come in to open the account and they would carry cash or uh, the traveler's check with them for at least the initial few days. And the tuition fee is remitted directly from 
India to to the to the universities. You will not need to do that anymore if you have this international bank account, which can be set up for the student before even lands in the US. So let me get this right. You're saying sitting out here, a parent can actually set up this entire process so that when the kid lands out there, he just has to walk through it. He'll probably get an ATM card or something of that sort, and that's actually good to go. So the kid has to be 18 year old plus with the account has to be on the name of the student himself. But yes, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm assuming that even if he's gone to his undergrad, he would be exactly. uh, 18 and that would save a lot yeah. of uh, you. So you're saying that's actually possible. Yeah. Interesting. And then you yeah. would actually, actually set up. Uh, hold on. So you would actually set up this, this entire process for me. So that would include some amount of advisory also and some amount of execution stuff also which is opening the account investing that's possible yeah uh, indeed actually uh you know of course we are currently as a broker but yes there's you know there's a lot of information available out there and you know progressively can be providing the appropriate advice as well right i just want to make one small sort of technical uh kind of point over there right uh, which which loops into the previous part say you know, you have this goal-oriented investing requirement for your kid's education, but mm. you've been investing in U.S. securities and they've done really well and now you want to liquidate them, right? Uh, but now you, you've been using this kind of investment portfolio for your child's education. Now, the challenge you'd otherwise have in the absence of the multi-currency account is you would need to repatriate those proceeds back to India because mm. a custodian can only send money back to an account in your own name and then re-remit it back to, you know, the destination or so on. Yeah. Um, now the RBI actually allows you to continue, you know, making the proceeds post tax payments, you know, the appropriate tax payments as you desire so that you aren't double tripping on your LRS requirement. Uh, wow. And that's the efficiency, right? Because okay. now, okay, I've done phenomenally well on the Amazon, uh, on my Amazon story and I want to sell portion of it. Uh, and, and that's, that's the utility case as well for the multi-currency account. Uh, so it, you can, be goal oriented investing by providing a much larger uh, product space together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think so. This is a good time to even get in this bit of thematic investment out there, right? Because if I'm saying that in the next whatever 10, 15 years from now, I'm expecting that healthcare as a as a concept will boom because people want to be more safe and investments in vaccines will go up. So you guys can actually set up that theme for me globally, not just for US, right? Because there are some very interesting pharma companies in in, in Israel for that matter. So how would that work with you guys? Is, is that even possible? Uh, so I think we'll, uh, you know, one of the, the distinctions is that we, by being based in the UK, we can, of course, have a much larger access to securities platforms globally, right? Um, each and every one, of course, will be a, a unique relationship. And, and finally speaking, there is a member in some exchange at, at every location. Note, of course, that the U.S. markets still tend to be the most cost efficient markets uh, for people to be investing in, which is, which is a clear challenge for people in India, right? For example, in, in the LSE, if you're for a stock list today, you're paying 0.5% stamp duty on, on a secondary market transaction. Uh, but yes, you know, to answer your question, you know, sort of, more generically, um, if you are able to access securities, in not just in the US, but even beyond the US and many other markets, and you want to be able to liquidate those securities and, and hold those proceeds continuously overseas, we can enable for that, in effect. Okay, interesting. So I want to touch upon some other thing that I saw on your website. Um, so, you know, how can Indians invest in alternative investments like real estate and private investments? Overseas, I mean, real estate sounded really interesting to me. How how does this part work? How does uh, Binvesta come in here? Sure, real estate has, as you say, it, it sounds interesting because the domestic, I think, yields on real estate in India have been compressed massively in the last five to ten years. There have been practically almost zero returns, uh, in, in at least at a lot of cities there. Uh, so investors have been looking overseas, and I will give you a few examples on the challenges that they face currently I, I don't know if you might have seen a few expos for real estate investments overseas along with you know those visa yes, programs yes. where there are right, one few many of those in mumbai happening all the time <laughs> uh, so we also were a part of you we visited one and we we're trying to understand the challenges that people are facing and one that was 
that stood out was not having a bank account overseas, which would enable you to, uh, let's say, provide for the maintenance of the property and also receive any kind of rental income uh, mm. back into the bank account. So we asked, how is it being done now? So every time you receive a rental income on a monthly basis, it's remitted back to your Indian account. So not only you pay a hefty uh, FX transfer fee on that, there is also a buyer transfer fee that gets deducted. And as Swastik mentioned, again, you are not able to hold those proceeds overseas. And uh, you uh, every time you're resetting your LRS limit, when you get that income back or even the capital proceeds after liquidating the assets back into India. So by having this bank account, the local bank accounts in US, UK, and Europe, what we are enabling is for you to uh, receive those rental incomes, reallocate uh, assets when you want to liquidate those, uh, pay for maintenance and so on. Right? So that's that's the bit about the real estate. Similarly, for startups as well, it helps having those bank account again, because let's say you put a money in a Silicon Valley startup, it grows 50x in three years and uh, you receive the proceeds. Now, it's, mm. again, if you bring the money back into India, you are essentially resetting the LRS. Uh, but by having a bank account and putting the proceeds there, you can reinvest those in more Silicon Valley uh, startups at the same point. Last bit uh, on the real estate and uh, startups is the democratization that is happening in this uh, asset class. In these asset classes in US and UK, you will see in the West specifically, you will see a lot of new platforms like uh, uh, fractional real estate, crowdsourcing for startups are uh, are very commonplace now. And India, in India, this is just starting to happen, but uh, there is no you know, need of having a uh, $500,000 investment for buying a real estate anymore. You can put in as little as $20,000 uh, and own a piece of a, of a much larger property complex, for example, in the US. So th- those are the things which uh, are... So you know, I didn't know that. I knew about fractional shares, uh, you know, say something like a Berkshire Hathaway, which is seriously expensive mm-hmm. and you might not have the money to buy, you know, or you might not want to buy an entire share of the, the main... Uh, the, 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 the A class. class of the A class, yeah. yeah, that's what. Yeah, I didn't know that's possible in real estate. How, how would that work? You know, we are <laughs> sitting out here. We are just used to owning, you know, our own three BHKs or one BHKs in a condo or you know in some multi, uh, multi apartment building. How does fractional real estate work? It sounds interesting. So it's. Yeah, so it's usually these are more in cases of, uh, you know, the properties which are being developed or which are the whole complexes owned by a single single company. So you would own, they, they would fractionalize the whole real estate into multiple parts. You can invest as much as you want. And whenever they, they sell it out, you would get the fraction that you own in that property. So it is not, it's not like you're buying, uh, you know, 10% of a 1BHK, you're buying half a percent of, of a building, essentially. Okay. It's sounding to me that, you know, given the kind of uh, products that you guys have on offer, I just want to get one thing out of the way. How easy or difficult is the regulatory and taxation perspective of all of these investments? You know, because you mentioned a lot of times that repatriating money and doing a lot of stuff. So some of our listeners might not be, might not even be aware of such a thing. So could we just in brief touch upon how easy or difficult is it to even understand the a the operational aspects and b the taxation aspects sure i'll, I'll definitely ha- happy to you know sort of touch upon taxation right and um, see unlike in india for example if you speak of securities whether listed in the us the uk or so on there's no capital gains tax if you are not resident in in the country or you're not a U.S. person if you're in the U.S., which basically means a U.S. citizen, a green card holder, or uh, working there in the U.S., right? The So there's no capital gains tax if it's securities. Real estate, however, is a slightly different monster because each country does have a tax on real estate of its own kind. Um, and uh, and that's where, you know, things, of course, do slightly start getting uh, um, a bit more complex. India, of course, has double taxation avoidance agreements with all the major developed economies, right? So you sort of, if there is any marginal tax that you're paying even on the real estate, you can offset it against your total tax bill domestically. Um, and uh, and yeah, and that's one of those unique distinctions because here, of course, in India, we're quite used to doing something like a tax deduction at source and, and you don't really have that, especially for capital gains in much of the West if you're not 
you know, base there, except for real estate. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. if I have to add on the operational... Topic. Sorry, go on, Prati, please. Yeah. So, on the operational bit on how to, you know... It, does that help answer the question? Anupam? It does, it does, it does, it does. Yeah, it does. I mean, I'm just thinking that this would be different from country to country and you and you offer investments all across countries, right? So, it could be US, UK, it could be Singapore... I guess that's something that you would have to figure out for each uh, for each transaction that a person does. So yeah, you you answered that. Prateek, please go on. So I was just touching upon the operational aspect, as you say. Uh, let's say specifically for opening the bank account or the U.S. securities. Uh, it's it's a very very streamlined and an easy process. You can you can onboard using our app within a few minutes. We have had cases where someone opened the account in the morning and by evening, or opening the account in the evening and by morning, the proceeds had already reached. The U.S. and the account was ready to start trading next next day. Right? So it's a very very streamlined process. The only documents you need is your PAN card and your Aadhaar card, and a quick selfie video would enable you to open these accounts. Yeah, so I, I was actually so, yeah, no, that's that's actually my next question as to how easy or difficult it is to onboard. How does your app work? How is the process? Because I remember when I tried this a couple of years ago, I I remember trying to open an account with a foreign brokerage and it didn't work. Uh, linking my domestic bank account just got stuck somewhere and then I just lost interest in the, in the entire product. So guys, walk our listeners through the process. You know, how smooth is the onboarding process? What do I need to sign up? Is there a minimum bank balance that I need if, I, if I'm interested on the banking side or does... Or even in the U.S. brokerages also, I believe they allow you to park some cash with them and you even earn interest on, on the cash. So I want to split this into two or three questions. First, the process. And two, what are the first things to do to get started? Sure. So um, thankfully, you know, things have improved a lot since then. And, you know, especially with the platform that we've built, you need a PAN card, an Aadhaar card and a selfie video. And one of the, you know, the interesting observations many of our clients tell us is that Actually, it's opening your U.S. brokerage account is far, far quicker than opening your domestic brokerage account, right? <laughs> I can, yeah, you know, I, I totally get that. I remember there was a time where uh, opening a brokerage account in India required, I think, more than 40 or 50 signatures. My God, that was a total, I don't know. Yeah, so go on, please. Yeah, I get what you're saying. So uh, literally, and, and the way when we say it is that it's, we're not just saying it it's, as being paperless, we are actually saying that this is completely digital. And I'd like to make that distinction as well, because, you know, you have to literally take a photograph of your PAN card, you take a photograph of your Aadhaar card, front and back, and you take a live selfie video. And, you know, as long as user behavior is fine, your account can be ready in 15 minutes from you downloading the app, right, which includes your US brokerage account. Um, the, and so that's that's how quickly you know we can help you opening your US brokerage account. Many of the banks have now allowed digital remittance for this category. So they're banks like ICICI, IDFC, IDBS, for example, that have been working hard on this. And you can uh, you know just send. We've got the detailed instructions of how you can remit the money and the destination account. By the end of the day, before US markets are about to open or so very often our clients see the money in their account, right? Uh, and that's actually the power of this entire digitization of the KYC process, which has allowed for uh, us to be able to build a product so smoothly and so quickly. Um, about the linking of the bank accounts, I think that's, you know, we you can't link your India link, particularly for an instant remittance, because that that process is still controlled by the 81 banks, the authorized dealer banks in India in terms of, you know, they're the ones that have the licenses. So you must uh, need to still uh, remit the capital from your bank account currently in India. Um, However, of course, like you mentioned, with the introduction of the overseas accounts, asset reallocation becomes far, far smoother and swifter. And we foresee that in the next few months, we'd be able to have, you know, a very seamless experience between your international bank account and your international brokerage accounts, in effect, where you can have almost instantaneous uh, deposit movements between your account and your brokerage. Yeah, so I want to ask you on that. Now, let's say that I have a domestic bank account with an HGFC or an ICICI, whoever it is. Um, would that be required for me to fund my US bank account? Or that's not required. I mean, I can directly open a US bank account, link it to my US brokerage account, and that's it, I'm done. How does that work? 
Well, I think you could, but the question is that how do you receive the proceeds first, right? Um, ah, okay. So okay. even you know when you have to fund it, of course. Uh, well, what we allow through the creation of the ba- international bank account is asset reallocation far, far more easily and smoothly. Uh, this the first funding, of course, will need to be from you know proceeds that you have uh, you know uh, got elsewhere, which would tend to by default be in India today. Okay, understood. So that means that if I want to set up a thousand dollar balance into my account and start you know buying an Apple share or a Netflix share or whatever it is out there. I would need an Aadhaar card, a PAN card, a selfie video, and then that's it. You take care of everything else. And then I have to fund that account with $1,000, which is, I don't know, maybe 75000 bucks from my side to that. And that's it. I'm done. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Pretty okay. Much. And so, so that means that the onboarding process is entirely through your app. The onboarding is absolutely through our app. The remittance okay. portion is still outside of our app. And that's, uh, that's because, as we mentioned about how the banking channel in India must, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that would mean that I, I would need to set up a beneficiary account in my domestic bank account and then transfer money there. Would that also exactly. Would, okay, understood. So uh, any costs and fees out here that our listeners should be aware of? So there are, um, in terms of the transaction costs, you know, the way we've, we've sort of modeled it is that we've got a certain number of, you know, minimum securities, which actually would be, you know, adequate for most number of clients are free uh, to trade. And we give in the first month, 10 transactions free per client, you know, when you sign up. And then beyond that, every every month you'll have at, uh, you'll have three, three transactions free, over which it's sort of like a fixed cost model, you know, a flat $1 fee per transaction, uh, doesn't matter size of transaction, for example, right? So we've got this sort of freemium model uh, to our, accounts that we are creating we do expect that is you know based on the use cases that we'd see developing over their bank accounts and and so on that we might have a slightly different cost structure to that but that's still a, a little bit away the uh, but yeah you know we we see a lot of interest from from people wanting portfolio investment products and so on and uh, and as and when we introduce that you know there might be a, additional transaction fees the fees there, you know, they tend to be, of course, third-party fees, in, which are not part of investors' uh, commission schedule or so, which could be your bank would charge you a fee on FX. So it really does help to see, you know, which of your bank providers is the most cost-efficient for your FX. Uh, you might want to, uh, there is a, you know, a singular swift fee when you try to repatriate capital back or you, you want to be uh, just cognizant of those. Um, there is a fixed third-party cost to ensure that you are, you know, not being taxed in the U.S. as a U.S. Uh, resident. So, which is called as signing off on the W-8 Ben, and that's a one-time cost of five dollars. Uh, that's a cost that you know you just pay once and you're done. It's to disclose to the U.S. tax authorities, hey, don't charge me like a U.S. tax resident. Don't charge me capital gains taxes. I'm not here. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm an Indian resident, in effect. Uh, and for that declaration, it's a fixed $5 fee. So those are, uh, those are in general, I think, the, the fees that our platform has, uh, that a person, an Indian a person is likely to incur. Sure. Sure. Last couple of questions. We just, you know, just about wrapping up uh, the show. One I wanted to ask is, what about advisory and research services, if at all you guys offer that, you know, because this is an asset class which is fairly new. Uh, someone out here in India, for example, the simplest product that he can do is an SIP in 20, into an index fund. That really doesn't take too much of uh, customized support or research reports and buy recommendations and sell recommendations. But if I'm someone who wants to start start off in the US, um, do you guys have anything specific out there to, to help me make better decisions? Uh, yeah, that's actually a good question. You know, what we currently and this points back to the point that I mentioned about, you know, the regulatory status, right? We want to be absolutely clear that, you know, uh, we aren't trying to subvert any of the the uh, legislative requirements and the regulatory requirements here overseas or so on. At the moment, you know, we are organized as a broker. Uh, will we be offering, you know, products which are advisory or recommendations, etc.? Absolutely. We clearly see that as part of the products that we'd be offering. But we want to be 
sure that we're not misrepresenting to our clients something that, you know, today uh, I'm not offering it simply because I don't have the night necessarily regulatory status or, or so on, right? I think, but as part of product requirement, yes, that's it's definitely something that we see and we hope to be able to provide, you know, portfolio products very soon for that. Talking about very soon, what do you guys have in the future planned for us? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, of course, all of these, you know, natural extensions of, of the uh, securities products, I, I think, are part of what we uh, look to working and providing to the end clients. Um, there are, you know, we clearly see that the multi-currency account is a very interesting use case. And one of the, the key parts is that we look to seeing, especially in light of COVID-19, what that does to to various sectors like travel or it, it probably trends to unleash new diff, new and different sort of sectors, uh, whether it's freelancing or otherwise. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think progressively we, so all of these, all of these, I think we've got, we've got quite a bit enough on our plate already, which we've, we've spoken through on the podcast in terms of the priority set. I think we're quite focused on ensuring that we, have a great design experience for a product. Actually, that's one one key part that we didn't speak of. That we've spoken of product, we've spoken of securities, but I still feel that a lot of fintech products in India are relatively poorly designed, mm-hmm. and we keep our design team outside of India uh, so that we don't land up at the moment, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, just getting utilized to the to a feeling of of a lower quality product. So we've sort of struggled. Yeah historically with that so we're quite keen that we have a wow feature to what our product looks like um as well as ensuring that you know the, the, the remittance tends to be as as seamless as possible um yeah Pratik, do you want to add anything on, on that on that uh, yeah we have we have a couple of more exciting products coming out to be rolled out soon in the pipeline we uh, they still haven't been disclosed, so we can't comment on that. Okay. But if you follow us on our social media or the newsletters, uh, you know, to, you'll be the first to know, uh, and that will be soon as well within the month. Maybe we can have you guys back on the show to, you know, once these features are up and running because it sounds like a very Absolutely. interesting product. Absolutely, it's going to be a very exciting feature on a product itself. Looking forward to that. And on that note, for better things in the future, this is a wrap on the global investing special. With Winvesta, you can check out the website winvesta.in. That's W-I-N-V-E-S-T-A dot in. And their app is there on Google and on Apple. And you can check out the app to see how it works. My guests for the show, Swastik Nikam, founder and CEO at Winvesta. And Pratik Jain, co-founder and head Americas at Winvesta. Swastik and Pratik, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us, Anupam. Thanks a lot, Anupam. It was a pleasure. Sure. I wish you guys all all the best for, for the future. Hope to have you guys back soon. And folks, if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM network. You can listen to us on the IBM podcast app or ibmpodcast.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are IBM podcast on Twitter and Instagram. I'm your host, Anupam Gupta, B50 on Twitter. Thank you so much for listening to Pesha No material on the show should be considered as financial advice. The material on the show is for informational purposes only. Please consult a financial advisor before taking any investment decision. Do you wish you were smarter? Well, so do we. But the next best thing? We could make you sound smarter. And to help you with this endeavor, we are Simplified, Ooh. a podcast uh, that attempts to break down the complex world around you with a uh, little knowledge, a lot of poor jokes, and a ton of random trivia. Episodes out every Monday on the IVM Podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. See ya! Namaskar, this is Ashish Vidyarthi. Yes, my friend, these are challenging times, but in these challenging times, we can create something extraordinary. Do take time to listen to my podcast, Begin the Journey, available on the IVM podcast, website, app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Remember, we have a great opportunity called life. Cheers.